So, so let me thank my, um, the co-members of our little panel, and Bob Wilden will talk a little bit more about the ISCC after I present a few um, items, and uh, Wendy Rubenstein has graciously allowed to take some notes, and um, thanks to Julie also for her input. So I think one interesting thing, and this is like um, shamelessly sucking up to Eric Green, um, but <laughs> here it goes. Uh, I, I really liked some of these um, comments that he and Greg made in a, in a piece in JAMA a couple years ago, because I think it makes us think about what is the goal of education, and just a few lines from this. Um, clinicians need not become geneticists to make use of genomic advances any more than they need to become radiologists to make use of imaging, and that the genomics community has to align our educational priorities with those of the health profession groups we wish to educate. Uh, and really apt, considering the discussion that we just had, all clinicians are going to need informatics support to interpret and act on genomic information relative to patient care and ensuring that high quality software tools are available will be more important than forcing them to understand the intricacies of how these tools work. And I put this up here partly uh, to just get discussion going and get us thinking about whether um, we're all going at this the, the right way. Um, I am part of uh, this uh, group, which includes many people in this room, that um, this was a work that was done through one of the ISCC's committees to try to put together a framework for developing physician competencies in genomics. And this is a, I don't know, six or seven page document with tens and tens of these bullet points of um, elements of a competency uh, tasks that would need to take place, which I think includes an incredible expectation of expertise on the part of clinicians. So knowing the indications for genomic testing, um, explaining all the implications of putting the results in the chart, how incidental findings are going to be handled, um, on and on and on. I, I do think that it's actually quite a detailed list of uh, tasks that we would expect general clinicians to know in order to be competent in genomics and um, wonder whether that's realistic. So related to uh, GM8, uh, we've done a great job of putting together how all of the GM-funded focus programs and related programs deal with educational issues and also issues of genomic interpretation, and I've highlighted um, some of these here in, in red, and I won't belabor it, but just to say that there are many of the groups that are represented in this room that have taken on different aspects of education and of how to translate and interpret genetic information to try to make it usable um, by clinicians. Um, and likewise, a lot of barriers have been identified to doing this. Um, from different groups. These include things like harnessing social media and crowdsourcing methods, having concise, comprehensive, and interoperable lab reports, which we've just been talking about in um, panel seven, um, having use cases for CDS development, and um, the fact that there's differing education needs uh, across uh, different professional levels. So just a, a little bit of detail about some of the existing efforts on education of clinicians, and I've just summarized from CSER's documents um, some of the items that they have uh, listed, which include high visibility um, interactions with different scientific and professional expectations. Uh, Emerge has a working group on consent, education, regulation, and consultation. IGNITE has a working group, and then as we'll hear about from a moment, Bob has been very involved. The ISCC is completely devoted to clinician education, and the group that uh, I'm most closely involved with, CPIC, creates these um, gene drug guidelines, and we are trying to um, get these out widely to the community and get feedback from the community so that they're as useful as possible for those who are actually implementing pharmacogenetic guidelines in the clinic. So at first I had a little bit of trouble thinking why is reporting results so closely linked to education, but again I think about as we just heard in the last hour and as we heard about a lot yesterday, um, 
we, are, we all seem to be thinking that by doing a better job of concisely and effectively reporting genetic results to clinicians will obviate the need for didactic education or will at least minimize the need for very specific educational um, programs. And it also will put the emphasis on the most important elements of genomics that really are going to require clinicians to understand so that they're able to practice in this era of increasing genomic results. Um, but even in this task, I think it's, there's uh, some controversy in the field about whether we're really trying to interpret results so that they can, or report results so that they can be easily interpreted directly by the primary care clinician, or if the assumption is that still these results will need help from experts um, that needs to be asked for by the primary clinician in order to actually implement those results in their uh, clinical practice. And again, I mean, this problem has been recognized by many of our groups. So, uh, for example, eMERGE has programs to develop, implement, and evaluate the process of clinician-patient education from results. There's a, a, a an app and or website, myresults.org, that has patient information about genetic results. And um, my understanding is they're developing a genomic clinical decision support artifact repository. Um, and they can clarify that eMERGE people can clarify as we go along what's really uh, happening with that. And again, I think we've heard several times during this meeting about what kinds of repositories, what kinds of commons can be created by the genomics community, um, what kinds already exist so that we don't reinvent the wheel too many hundreds of times uh, in order to share information among all of us who are doing um, clinical implementation of genomics. We've also heard a lot about the IM, IOM Roundtable uh, group working on genomics and this uh, subgroup it has called Digitize, which many of us are involved in. And this is really highly relevant, again, to the discussion we just had, trying to enable standardized genetic information in the EHR to ensure interoperability and usability of the data in the clinic and for research applications. And so I guess I think that um, this is where we bring it back a, a bit to NHGRI, who's in the um, business of funding research that to do the kinds of EHR-based research, to do the kind of deep phenotyping we've been talking about, and even to use the clinical genomic information that's in the EHR, we've got to have um, a way to dig it out of the EHR, and we currently don't have interoperability or standardized terms. In the pharmacogenetic space, CPIC has taken on this problem of standardized terms um, because it's directly related to our ability to provide advice that can be directly utilized in the EHR by clinicians. And so we've gotten very, very specific about helping to standardize some terms that will result in being able to share information and build CDS to act on the genetic test results. If the CDS that's based on the genetic test results is really the way that we're going to, quote, educate clinicians then we have to build the terms that can drive the CDS. And right now, the EHR vendors are telling us, you don't have terms that can drive the CDS. Would, you, would your community please get their act together and decide on what terms we can use? So that's part of what we're doing in Digitize. Um, challenges have uh, uh, been identified, by, again, by several of the groups. So CSER has identified that these lab reports need to be developed and integrated and optimize interpretation of these given inherent time constraints in the clinic, especially for diseases that may have a poor prognosis and a short window for action. And they're trying to assess and report on common themes across the CSER uh, sites. Um, IGNITE has identified the differing education and training needs for different groups of um, uh, professionals and identified the issue that there's frequently rotating staff. Um, and uh, again, different kinds of modules for different kinds of clinicians. And CPIC is uh, identified that there's this limited set of use cases for genomic CDS. Uh, we are uh, now adding these in to every existing CPIC guideline as it is updated and adding this in to every 
a new CPIC guideline that's created, and I'll show you some examples of some of the uh, CDS that we provide. So just a little bit of background um, for those of you who don't know, um, CPIC was started in 2009. We have members all over the world. The goal is, is definitely to make each guideline be applicable um, internationally, not, not just in this country. And I, I won't go over in detail, but every guideline, thanks to the um, informatics working group that Mark and um, Bob Freimuth are both important parts of, has a, an algorithm, a clinical implementation workflow uh, that's an example of how it can work at the EHR. As we just mentioned, we recognize that every institution has different clinical workflows, but this is something that somebody can start with about how do you go from the result to um, the, the action ability, and um, oops, it includes very specific example language, interpretive language, based on the genetic test result um, that could be taken verbatim for interpreting that HLA, that HLA B test result in this case um, in the EHR of the individuals uh, implementing that gene. And it includes very specific, possible to copy and paste interpretive language or suggested language for the CDS point of care alerts that would fire either pretest if an individual has ordered a high risk drug and there's no high risk gene on file, or post test if they have a high risk gene uh, test result that's uh, existing in the medical record what would be an example of the kind of alert that you would fire in this case if the high-risk drug simvastatin were prescribed to a patient with a high-risk uh, phenotype for SLCO1B1. So this is an example of why uh, the test alert is going to fire off of some kind of trigger or condition based on the gene test result, and this is why CPIC and um, the digitized group have identified that coming up with specific terms to describe the high-risk phenotypes based on the genotypes is a critical aspect of making genetic test results go from the medical record into real clinical actionability, um, is, is that something has to drive that high-risk status of the patient, and it's going to be better if those terms are standardized. So we started back in November or so this project, the CPIC Term Standardization Project, with a lot of um, help from people involved in ClinGen and many other groups, as I'll show you. And the goal is very focused, very simple, and it is achievable. We will finish this in the next couple of months. We're trying to come up with standardized terms for allele functional status. And this would be an example of characterizing the allele as low, absent, high, or intermediate. So whether you call it a star 2, a, a G to A at position 233, uh, an amino acid substitution at position 88, you will, have an, uh, you will need an interpretation of the allele's function, and you will need to have an interpretation of the diplotype of the patient, which is really turned into the phenotype. And in pharmacogenetics, those would include terms like ultra-rapid metabolizer, extensive metabolizer, et cetera. So what we've been doing through this uh, Delphi process that started back in December is to have different phases of evaluating the landscape, clinical labs, literature, preferences, doing multiple surveys of experts, requiring those experts to participate in every survey, and coming to a consensus on what sets of terms can be used to describe allele function and to describe phenotype. And we're uh, close to the end of this process of at least being able to do that. And this is just a screenshot from one of the surveys that we did which I know is difficult to read, but this asks people to identify the groups with which they're associated, which again includes CPIC, ClinVar, the PGRN, the IOM uh, digitized group, uh, ClinGen's uh, working group, et cetera, et cetera, CDC, ACMG, 
and many others listed down here, the HL7 Clinical Genomics Working Group, eMERGE, et cetera, et cetera. So we really tried to get as many groups as possible to buy into this process and to participate in the survey so that we'll get as wide a buy-in as possible at the end of this for adoption of these um, two sets of terms. Um, and I will turn it over to um, Bob just to say that the um, Inter-Society Coordinating Committee uh, was uh, started in February 2013 after GM4, and it's specifically devoted to educational issues for clinicians, and we'll hear more about that from Bob. Thanks. So. Um I'm going to move on to my, this is from the ISCC website, uh, which uh, is being updated. And well, I guess I need to do spacebar. Okay. Uh, all right. So the ISCC um, uh, is the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics. That's why we call it ISCC. Uh, and I want to stay at, say at the output um, that uh, um, the ISCC was founded and driven by Terry Manolio and Mike uh, Murray. Uh, as, a, as the originating co-chairs until uh, around January when uh, I uh, took over and then Ann Cardi came on as my um, co-chair. So they deserve a lot of credit for all of the things that um, were going on. And then G2C2, which I'm also going to talk about, has been driven principally by um, Jane Jenkins in, in my branch. So uh, the ISCC uh, was indeed, um, uh, grew out of the Genomic Medicine Four meeting in 2013. And the, the main uh, goals you know, are, are to gather and facilitate, uh, I guess there's a mouse here, uh, facilitate dissemination of best practices and resources in genomics education, promote their translation into evidence-based clinical care. And then there's a, a part about, um, about competencies here, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Okay, so education, this is just my statement. Education is the science and process of disseminating evidence and methods of use. So there are a lot of words and verifying effects. So a lot of words that are overlapping with, with what genomic medicine does. Science, a process, disseminating, evidence generation, and, and uh, methods of use as well. So just the, the, the concept isn't really that for, foreign when you break it down. All right. So um, the status summary for ISCC is in your ebook. So I'm not going to describe ISCC and all the different working groups and so forth. I was asked to discuss the gaps, overlaps, and opportunities uh, relating to the genetic, uh, genomic medicine working groups. Uh, and so I'm going to break it down into these three categories for the gaps. So uh, materials are those things that we teach. Uh, and they are essential for educators. Um, the Genetics and Genomics Competency Center, easily known as G2C2, is a searchable web-based clearinghouse for peer-reviewed educational materials. It's a product of NHGRI uh, with a lot of help from ISCC members. It has similar goals to the younger MedEd portal, which we do not control. That's a product of the American Association of Medical Colleges. There's some convergence going on there. Uh, but G2C2 is genomic medicine specific. G2C2 also um, uh, uniquely maps submitted and cleared resources to provider discipline specified competencies. So that's a set of things that allow educators and practitioners a systematic reference by which to judge completeness of their educational program. And these are like specific aims to researchers in, in a way. Um, the rate of educational resource uh, creation lags behind the emerging translational science. And so there may be an, a need for incentivizing uh, creation of educational resources. On the consumer side, practitioners and uh, their educators need to recognize the need for such re resources uh, and their availability. So marketing um, uh, could help with that, and we're investigating that as well. Um, an interesting educational material is how to communicate genetic and genomic concepts. So there's a lack of consistent, widely understood common language uh, to use when communication occurs around genetic and genomic issues in, in, the, in the clinic, uh, whether it be between the patient and the provider, between one type of provider and another type of provider, or between the provider and the laboratory, for example. And there are lots of examples you all know about, about problems in communication. So we'd like to know if there should be a preferred language uh, or a communication mode, including image, images, and if so, how to teach it. 
Um, so we, uh, we uh, uh, Mary already touched on the, the competency issue, and this is just the competencies um, map uh, um, link page in G2C2. Uh, and uh, establishing those competencies for genomic education as a method, and uh, the process of linking up those competencies with, uh, with the resources, and so each resource gets assigned a handful of competencies that, that it, uh, it speaks to, and that's an arduous manual process for the site's curators. So that's one of the, the challenges to um, uh, using this kind of a setup. So um, moving on to, to methods, um, how do we do it? How and when to make education happen? Uh, we can break it into several axes, and I was struck again with some alliteration. So uh, at what stage is, of a career is the training best done? Is it uh, for done at the um, academic training when you're in medical school, uh, after that in residency, uh, continuing med med medical education, or during uh, board certification or, or, or the maintenance of certification. So there are multiple levels, and probably the answer is all of them. On NPR radio this morning, driving in, I, I, I heard that we should be doing this at, on Sesame Street um, in early age. So, uh, <laughs> the, um, so the next question is, who are the targets? Physicians. Physicians don't operate in a vacuum. Non-physician non providers uh, also um, need to understand something, and we need to understand what they need to understand. And uh, there's a, a mode of um, education which is gaining some traction called interprofessional education, which tends to mimic the kinds of um, team efforts, uh, the team interactions that happen in, in the real clinical world. Um, who are the teachers? Are they all um, genetic geneticists, genetic counselors? How do you make more teachers who have street cred in their, uh, in their specialty? Um, and uh, uh, how do you know that the test, the uh, educational process that you're going through is working? How do we share our materials, methods, and effectiveness measures across uh, medical specialties and other um, uh, disciplines? Uh, and there are questions, these are all questions that have limited scientific answers. Um, so this is just an example of uh, something that uh, gained some uh, exposure at the November 2014 uh, ISCC in-person meeting, uh, and that's a promising teaching approach where uh, tr for, that was developed for training pathology residents, and it was presented by Rich Haspel, and involves using flipped classrooms, problem solving in groups, and real-time use of online databases. Uh, so, an, uh, from from that presentation, a new innovative approaches working group was founded within ISCC to explore how to make this approach uh, uh, apply to training other residents and other types of um, providers. And several training events, including a train training session, have or will happen this year as a result of that. Um, so, point of care education is a large subject. It's another innovative approach that um, uh, EHRs and and the electronic world has begun to make. Uh, uh, possible, and it's kind of emblemized by the info button, which has a much richer possibility space uh, and has some real science behind it, which is great. Um, a persistent problem with clinical decision support is, is, as people have mentioned, alert fatigue, a phrase which conjures strange looks from people who don't understand the background, alert fatigue, you know. Um, so we're, we really need to solve the alert fatigue problem because, well, um, I have alert fatigue, alert fatigue. So I'm sick and tired of having it brought to my attention, so you need to solve it. All right. So one of the big problems uh, is motivation and, and, <clears throat> and relevance. And I think this has been spoken to a couple of times <coughs> Excuse me. already. So what motivates practitioners to learn about geno genomic medicine? Is it <clears throat> that they have to do it to continue practicing? They have to do it for their board certification or maintenance or certification? Right now, they don't really have to do it except for geneticists. Um, does it bring value to them? Does it bring coverage and reimbursement for what they want to do? Um, there are um, providers who really are in, in, involved in the patient outcomes. Does it improve patient outcomes? What's the evidence for that? Is it in the peer-reviewed literature? Is it um, supported by professional practice guidelines? Um, and are there system priorities? Are there healthcare system administrators saying this is something that they need to do? So um, I'm bearing all here. Uh, ISCC has some challenges. 
Um, it's made up of diverse mem uh, members of professional societies, um, kind of the guilds in a way, as well as um, representatives from several NIH uh, institutes and centers as well, and a few health systems. And uh, some of the challenges are inherent, uh, but can also be strengths, and others are addressable. So uh, members are varied. There are differences in governance, um, uh, especially for uh, focus on what they're trying to do. There are differences in roles and responsibilities as part of uh, the team. The mission, uh, each member society has its own mission, uh, and they don't necessarily overlap, but in general they're uh, abstractly aligned on the same goals. Uh, the mission, um, interestingly, is not a research mission. Um, the money is uh, an issue. The, it's a volunteer organization, no, no dues, no purse. It's not a research organization, so really doesn't pursue research grants. Uh, we are trying to get approval to seek donor uh, funding uh, through the Foundation for NIH. Um, just for perspective, last week, if you were at the Clinton meeting, you heard that uh, um, in the UK, the National Health Service is planning on spending 20 million pounds on provider education for genomic medicine. Um, then the, the additional problem is metrics. How do we know if we're having any effect? And when uh, a specific, when do we know when specific education and genomics is no longer needed? So I'll close with a, an, an opportunity slide. So um, uh, uh, in the context of this m meeting, there are a few opportunities that uh, are intertwined with, with the ISCC, G2C2 resource, and uh, this group. Um, and the grid provided by Terry uh, and, and reviewed by Mary shows significant overlap, and uh, Mary went over those. Uh, and I think we should con consider having, exploring having some joint activities around those um, shared areas. Uh, one strength for ISCC is the opportunity to become the leader in facilitating provider education across discipline and specialty boundaries, not just through resource sharing, but also by helping advance the, the motivators uh, um, that I talked about. Um, for this group, one of the greatest opportunities potentially is connecting researchers with organizations whose members can facilitate research activities, particularly with respect to education, communication, and implementation. And uh, I added a little note here, and utility uh, um, uh, utilization of the learning healthcare system. Um, yesterday, there was also discussion, discussion about the emerging need for um, learning to do re-phenotyping, and could, there be, could that be a skill that's disseminated through the multiple specialties via ISCC? And it's kind of a two-way street, too. Can there be a, a crowdsourcing effort uh, um, for um, uh, finding out what are the needs in the community? And the societies are often populated by people who are the local champions for their specialty. And so if you want to try to reach those local champions, that may be a way to do it. And I'll stop there. So um, obviously there's lots of groups working on education, so some discussion points, I think, are to go back to do we know what we want uh, when we say education of clinicians? And are there, given that, are, are all the gaps and barriers that exist being addressed? And is the coordination um, of educational endeavors across projects adequate? And likewise, there are lots of groups working on how to report genetic results to clinicians. Uh, so again, I think, um, I, I left off, but I think one important thing is what, what's the goal of, of reporting the results? Is there a need or desire to catalog approaches, to harmonize approaches, and also uh, maybe to evaluate how are all of these approaches um, to reporting results being shared? And um, I'd like to open up the floor for discussion. <laughs> 